Okay, well, th thanks again, I am. It is going to be a bit of a rush through. Same number of slides, but less time. So, um, chlorhexidine allergy, this is number three of the big four. Um, chlorhexidine itself, as we've already heard, is ubiquitous. It's all over the place. Multiple, multiple, multiple product in all of our trusts that contain chlorhexidine. Multiple products in the pharmacy supermarket shelves. It's considered a hidden allergen because not many people actually know it's there with some of the items. I think we're growing more aware with things like the CVCs and um, uh, urethral gels, etc. Um, there is a geographical variation um, which may be related to under-recognition, different practices in testing, a different use of decontamination. Um, but chlorhexidine remains a highly effective antiseptic, and in some circumstances there are no other really suitable alternatives. So the uses include skin decontamination, lubricating gels, coated catheters, and often used in dental care. <coughs> so another thing that we find with chlorhexidine allergy, which is quite interesting from allergy clinic reviews, is up to potentially 80% of patients that are confirmed with a chlorhexidine-related anaphylaxis in an anesthetic-type allergy clinic describe a prior history of symptoms on exposure to chlorhexidine, whether that be topical or, or otherwise. Investigation is not standardized. Um, we don't know when the best time to test for is. We believe it's between four weeks and six months, and we don't really know which tests are best. We have some ideas. In the cases of chlorhexidine allergy, we, we can find positive results to other tests as well. So it's important to test for all of the potential culprits that patients have been exposed to, not just stop if we get a positive chlorhexidine. So it's number three, 18 cases in the NAPSIX data, representing 9%, 16 males, two females. This is, this is completely compatible with what's published and known about chlorhexidine. Six of these cases were urology, three cardiac, and three in orthopedic surgery. As we've already heard, we believe we've potentially overestimated the number of events per 100,000 exposures because only 75% roughly um, reported use of chlorhexidine in the allergen activity survey, which, as we've already shown, is, is likely to be an underestimate of exposure. There's one fatal case where there was a missed opportunity to investigate for specific ID against chlorhexidine. So these are the exposure routes um, of, of the cases that were involved. And just to put in perspective, those that were related to a coated CVC had their reactions within five minutes of exposure, and they were severe reactions. Whereas those with surgical site exposure had a much longer time to reaction and tended to have less severe reactions. There were no cases in the NAPTIX data where the only reported exposure was skin preparation for cannulation. So these are the clinical features, um, both at any time and presenting. And the only thing I really wanted to highlight, which has already slightly been touched on, is a complete absence of bronchospasm as a presenting feature of chlor chlorhexidine um, anaphylaxis in the NAPSEX data set, which is different to the general data cohort. So what are our key findings again, then? So we've got, often it's not suspected by the index anaesthetist evolved at the time. If I recall correctly, it was around 70-something percent of the index anaesthetist recognizing the cause overall in the data cohort. However, in chlorhexidine, it's only 28 percent. There were three potentially avoidable cases. One had reported a prior chlorhexidine allergy and was still exposed. One had reported prior perioperative allergy that was not investigated. And one was a NAPSIX confirmed case of chlorhexidine allergy that went forward for further surgery and was exposed in that second surgery to chlorhexidine again. Another thing that we found is chlorhexidine-coated central lines were not always removed. So two of the six cases didn't have the lines removed. That's obviously an opportunity. If a patient becomes unwell after a coated line is put in, it's probably a good idea to remove that line. 16 patients had dynamic tryptase, which Bill's already touched on, and testing for chlorhexidine was frequently omitted in the main data set. And testing doesn't always follow recommendations. So this is a pattern of testing, and I'm not going to go through it in too much detail in the interest of time. But the key thing is that it's currently recommended that we have at least two testing modalities for chlorhexidine, whether that's skin prick test, IgE, or intradermal. Um, and in three cases, 
Um, we had more than one trigger identified on testing, coming back to what we said before. So our key recommendations. It's important to label items that contain chlorhexidine because we recognise it as a hidden allergen. Alternatives should be available in all of our theatres and, and hospitals. There should be a policy within hospitals highlighting the alternatives. All cases should be tested with chlorhexidine with at least two modalities of test. All potential culprits should be tested. We need to improve the awareness of chlorhexidine allergy and allergy history taking. Chlorhexidine CVCs should be removed when anaphylaxis occurs following exertion. Thank you.